Hello. Hey, Carol. Hey, <laughs> welcome to tonight. I know um, you've um, you've had a bit of a torrid time uh, with COVID, uh, and you had some uh, dental surgery today um, on on your face. Uh, well, obviously on your face, so uh, you're in a little bit of pain. <laughs> um, but uh, thanks for um, thanks for still persevering and, and being able to do um, to do tonight. So. Um, Carol, you know, so much um, has been happening, um, well, globally, but certainly uh, close by to Poland uh, in Ukraine and the tragic situation that's happening there. And um, it, it just seems kind of right to, to sort of initiate this conversation regarding events there. Um, and I just wondered um, how, how you are um, in yourself, but also in terms of I know that you'll have quite close contact with with friends um, and members of your network who are in Ukraine. Um, and I just wondered if you could just briefly, you know, uh, explain and, and describe the situation that that you and, and your friends are finding yourselves in. Yeah, it's by my day and night almost uh, every day now since it started. Uh, it's more than two weeks now, and uh, to give you a picture, I uh, yeah, like two days before it all started, this Russian aggression on Ukraine, I have the meeting on Zoom with one of the friends artists because we are together in the Ukrainian Polish project dedicated dedicated to the queer history. So it was like Tuesday we had a Zoom and she said, oh, I'm coming back to Kyiv soon, but uh, with my parents in the house in Vinnytsia. And then uh, two days later, she's supposed to send drawings and suddenly, you know, everything happened. So it's what I wanted to say. Uh, and, w and when I come, it's really weird because this feeling that you are in the middle of Europe, you are writing on Instagram to your friend, so how are you? And she said, like, I'm just in a basement now. But she's still replying on Instagram. So it's this feeling of something that is so close. And so it's really terrifying. And it's taking some time, some days to understand what, how, how, uh, how it really works. And then the bomb, bomb, this bombs on the cities, she escaped now. But the other people are in the different cities, in Lvov, in Kyiv. I was uh, actually quite often, maybe the, the, the most visited um, country from all the region was uh, Ukraine, because we have quite close connections. Mm -hmm. but, uh, many of them were related to my research, which is visible also in the exhibition. Although with this uh, Ukrainian part, I was always focusing more on the deeper history. Uh, and uh, yeah, and the images and the stories that are related to are also become really relevant nowadays, especially when we see what is happening with the media coverage. That makes me nervous most of the time because uh, people really believe, and many of my, but this time from France or Italy or uh, some so-called Western countries, that they they don't understand or they don't want to understand or they don't care or they really at least think that it's some kind of problem very far away and it's really not the case and um, what I'm trying to say is also that this uh, narration uh, about the nation, language and culture it's important and I'm always trying to avoid this nationalistic vision of you know building the image of the country by the kind of, uh, I don't know, I don't even know how to express, but uh, in that case it become really important to talk about the independence of the Ukrainian culture because so many people were questioning, not only Russia and Putin saying that it's just our brothers and our land so and so on, but the, um, even uh, Western leftist theoreticians saying that, oh, maybe, like they are treating this as a fight between America and Russia, completely avoiding the fact that it's an independent country of own culture history that was just attacked. So this is constantly coming to my mind when I'm working on this archive. I, uh, my idea was to rewrite uh, this mainstream narration brings some unrepresented stories from the queer perspective, but now it looks like even these queer figures that are connected with the national history are just standing for the independence of this particular country. And uh, yeah, it's a 
it's quite a mixed yeah I have mixed feelings about all this uh, articles that I read all this uh, uh, you know statements and so on yeah sure sure just because I've been sort of following your um, your sort of Instagram stories it as you say you've sort of been really totally preoccupied with this situation and and trying to sort of do what you can in terms of um, sharing perspectives, but also kind of resources and certain things. I just wondered from, it's kind of interesting for us, sort of, uh, you know, I'm sort of digesting a lot of the situation between the sort of BBC or The Guardian and the TV and sort of Twitter and social media. And that's from my kind of perspective of being based here in the UK. How are you sort of seeing the, the sort of portrayal of the situation differently from from where you are in sort of, uh, media channels that are maybe local to Poland or or in in that kind of region of Europe. Yeah, I think most of the other countries' medias are concentrating on analyzing more the situation in, in a more global perspective. And for for Poland, uh, because of the history, but also because of geography, it's just like border. Uh, so uh, so it's like it's a neighbor country and. Uh, for example, reading Nam Homsky saying that Poland should not be in uh, NATO or, you know, not uh, asking for help. Uh, it really sounds like if it would, if uh, if Putin would make a next step, it would be the Poland, right? So for me, it's just a few hundred kilometers that everything is happening. And mm -hmm. They, they, the, the government confirmed that uh, one million to more than one million and two hundred thousand of people came to Poland, just to Poland, and uh, like eight uh, hundred thousand are in Warsaw. So it's completely changing the, you know, on the street, almost the third person you are meeting speaking. Uh, Russian or Ukrainian or Belarusian and people are also confused because it's another thing that we don't that some especially Polish Ukrainian is quite close the languages but it's not the same and many Ukrainians speak also Russian language so this attitude of be, you know censoring everything that is Russian uh, and then supporting Ukrainians it's become really confusing also for the people on the street mm -hmm. All the people I know are involved in uh, helping. So they are doing hundreds of sandwiches for people who are coming. They are uh, serving with their flat and so on. So it's like really almost everybody's occupied with that. They so oh, mm -hmm. it's work now because, you know, I'm coming back to helping. So it's um, something very real and intense. Yeah, yeah, sure. I wonder if just briefly... You could just sort of go back in terms of just talking around um, sort of Poland. Uh, so we sort of go back in time a little bit just to thinking about the sort of pre-situation in Ukraine. And I know you talked a lot about there's being this sort of eroding of of certain uh, progression that's taken place in Poland, should we say, towards uh, sort of gay rights and um, attitudes towards the LGBTQ community. And I know that um, those progressions are probably pretty subjective, but I, I know there's been this sort of uh, sort of change in government and there's been certain sort of attitudes which are sort of quite regressive. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit um, about that situation um, in, in Poland in terms of the sort of political structure. Yeah, it's really weird, especially now it's even more confusing with this government because the government is almost doing nothing, but people are so engaged that it looks like Poland it, doing good with, you know, the crisis. But regarding the LGBT plus community situation, it's like probably the the worst and the best moment for community because in one hand, the, there is a strong homophobia, but it's coming from the authorities, from the, from the proposals of the law and so on. And it's very present. It's this anti uh, Anti-LGBT propaganda is a part of the politics. It's really visible. It's everywhere. But because of that pressure, it's also very uh, big uh, resistance and uh, big visibility. So many groups, um, like last two, three years, uh, you have completely new generation of the not only LGBT people, but also the 
activists that are literally coming on the streets, organizing themselves. Every Polish city has now kind of a organization and uh, pride and so on. So it's uh, it's also become much more diverse. It's not just the gays and it's uh, like non-binary transgender people are also much more represented now and this topic appears in the media. Also because of the very strict laws that were proposed uh, by the government and the homophobic statements by the prominent politicians, homophobic and transphobic and so on. So media started to explaining people and it, because of that, this visibility and activity of the activists become really s stronger than ever. So that's why I'm saying it's a good and bad um, mm. It's definitely an interesting moment also for me to see it from the perspective. Uh, in 2005, I made the show called Fags, and it was called the first openly gay exhibition in the history of the country. So just like 15, 17 years ago, yeah, it was like okay, something is starting. But now I'm not don't don't feel like I'm super old, and I'm just remembering some old times. But not also the very uh, first line of the activism, and that thing is giving me the perspective, and maybe it's helping me also to understand when I talk with people who are 60 plus or 70 plus about the 80s and 70s and 90s. So this um, idea of progress or the fights for the rights, it's really, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not like, uh, how to say, um, it's not the it's a very um, specific process with many perspectives. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Um, I think I, I was always quite interested in the, or well, timing of exhibitions has been very difficult <laughs> over the past couple of years due to COVID and having to reschedule so much. But I was really interested in in sort of bringing in this portrait um, or representation of um, sort of Poland or, as you sort of say, so-called Eastern Central Europe and a sort of uh, and queer culture there. And bringing that into um, into where well, Nottingham, but also the UK, and just this idea of, as you sort of uh, sort of allude to, this sort of progression on one hand, and then sort of regression on the other hand. That we things are becoming more visible, and um, we are more used to representation in certain aspects of society and culture. But at the same time, things almost become more sort of stealth-like, and and regression and, and rights being taken away feels like it's more hidden in some way, which almost feels like uh, equally as much of a threat in some, in some respects. Um, I guess um, what I'm interested in, in sort of getting to in some ways is, and I know this is perhaps looking ahead too far and I don't want to um, do that too much because the situation um, in Ukraine and its effect on other countries is we have no idea um, how far that's going to escalate or what's going to happen next. But I guess things like um, war um, or disasters generally, whether they are uh, natural or man-made, uh, very quickly in the short term reduces concerns within the society to simple, quite sort of binary things in terms of life and death and staying alive or, or dying. And some of the sort of uh, the conversations, the more sort of nuanced conversations in society have to sort of be uh, put to, to one side for a time. And I'm just interested to know how um, you could see the situation necessarily affecting the LGBTQ community um, more so than anybody than anybody else in society as, as a result of what's been happening in Ukraine. And if there's anything specifically affecting them right now in the war um, and, and what's affecting them more so than other people. Yeah, it's really uh, complicated uh, because there are different aspects. One aspect is really that, uh, for example, for transgender people, it's really hard to move out from the country because there is a law that when you are a man eight, from 18 to 60, you have to stay in the country, so only women and kids and teenagers can leave. So if you are a transgender man and you have not proper documents or you are in the transition or you are starting or you are you don't have proper documents, then it's a, a lot of problems for the people with HIV. There's a problem with medications and also crossing and so on. I really, literally yesterday I got the message from a young gay guy from Poland who said that he is afraid and asking me if I could help him because he's uh, have this A, like being uh, 
first line ready to go to the war if it will happen that Poland will be organizing something. So they felt people also in Poland feel the threat that they will be uh, they have to go to the army or you know do something uh, that. And there is a very strong uh, movement of LGBT community in Ukraine that they are joining the army and they are even f uh, formulating their own kind of groups and they have special um, donations, special um, kind of organization. Uh, but I always, when I work with the history, for me it was interesting to talk about the, you know, Second World 19th century, the national heroes that we know that probably they were not straight, but in the same time you have the image of the guy with the gun and then you probably he was bisexual or, you know, or gay. And suddenly you see 20 something year olds boys that are standing with the real guns. They are not like hospital, they're really formulating the, the part of the army and it's really confusing also for me. I'm a pacifist, but then when you talk with them and you see they are really literally fighting for their houses, for their families, and uh, a lot of questions coming for you, what you would do in that situation, because I thought I would never be standing in front of that kind of questions. I, I thought I'm just researching the history. So uh, this is really happening in an eyewitness in so it's really interesting for me. Uh, yes, I, I said to my friend that following this, I don't know, the young soul TikTok, you know, or an Instagram, it's like uh, it's like the Second World War in the 3D color and you can experience. And I think it's completely going to change. It's already changing the understanding and the... Uh, the way we also educate people, because for many years, when you spoke with teenagers, you have to explain these weird books about the Second World War, about this uh, stuff, and like, yeah, the history is over. But and even when I was working and with the queer histories in the past, many people were saying, "Oh, you know, it's really gone. It's like really the old times." And suddenly, all these things are coming back. Uh, even with the questions of this national and queer heroes, like Lesia Ukrainka, the one that I prepared the print and it's presented on the in the gallery on this gallery of portraits, or Taras Shevchenko, the big Ukrainian hero from the ninth century. Uh, when I was in Ukraine, we were laughing that oh, this is this guy. He's everywhere on the on the monuments. Uh, the metro station is called his name, and probably. We know that he was bisexual or gay, but you can't. You are not allowed to talk about it because he's such a big hero. But then, when this war started, you started to read about him, and he was really brave. And actually, you're starting to point out the parts of his biography that he was. Uh, he became also the hero for the contemporary uh, fighters, also for the queer fighters. So it's really, really, really interesting to see how this history click with the contemporary times. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's quite an interesting. I mean, in terms of the the gallery of portraits series that you've done there, there's um, representatives in there who are um, who are known to be queer or trans or um, or gay, um, and they sort of lead with they lead. That's part of their sort of lead identity. And then there's other people in there who the populations uh, th their lead identity for that is that they are a hero, they are a fighter, and they they are not queer, or they're trying to wrap to very much separate that from that identity. So it's quite interesting to sort of see that um, transition through that through that whole series. How um, how popular and how in the mainstream are many of those figures in in that series? Is is part of your sort of work wanting to sort of get those people more into the mainstream, or is it about also trying to sort of tell the truth about who these individuals were and sort of reveal the reality of their identities with those with this series uh, and it's like this one it's called gallery of portraits and it's more focused on the whole region central eastern europe particular countries the previous one that was similar was only dedicated to poland and both of them were really focusing on the most prominent the most famous people that everybody in the country knows them and then 
you are writing about them and painting them in a way that you are um, rediscovering or putting a light on this part of the biographies that are queer somehow or non-heteronormative. And uh, yeah, with some of my projects I'm trying to find the people who are not known and talk about them, but actually this series is all about queering the mainstream, queering the canon or the, you know, the, the biggest uh, figures. And it's really interesting also Mm, this culture fight that started. Uh, we were talking about this Lesia Ukrainka, the poet writer from the ninth century, that is a big, big figure in Ukraine. But uh, the same time in Poland was Maria Konopnicka. She was also a poet writer, and she's the most celebrated uh, writer by the Polish nationalists because of her patriotic poems and songs. And in the same time, she was in the relation with women for 27 years. And so uh, she's really, there are a lot of proofs that she was uh, non-heteronormative. And then when <laughs> it get to the, so, so there was this kind of fight, if she is the queer icon now, or uh, national, uh, to take it back for her from the nationalist kind of um, circles. And then the government, Polish government, step into it and say that they are probably they think about preparing it's literally the law that if you will say she was lesbian, you not go to jail, but you have to pay some because uh. Uh, it's, it's coming together with this what Putin is doing and Trump, like this fake news and propaganda and so on. So it's really about uh, literally uh, fight about the biographies and mm -hmm. books are coming that are discovering those stories so it's really uh, on the level of not only pop articles but historians academics and scientists working on that and yeah I serve it with my paintings to more in uh, to more uh, bring this image to the common people so they see colorful painting made by me and uh, will be questioning maybe their parents uh, oh did you know that this particular writer she was lesbian or he was gay and uh, I know that because of this kind of portraits it's easier for them to remember that and to kind of um, start the conversation about it yeah sure sure yeah just um just coming back to that so sort of, I think it was a slightly long-winded question I thought um, formed in regards to sort of the polarizing effect of of disaster on on sort of politics or the more sort of nuanced parts of and issues in society. I'm just thinking in terms of the current um, um, sort of leadership in in Ukraine and um, and and rightly so being presented in this sort of very heroic way in terms of defending a country and having to do these sorts of things. And I guess in in it very much reduces and presents a certain leadership or a government or a political party in in, in a heroic sense and removes I guess some of the sort of um, um, or removes from the, cu the current conversation anyway perhaps certain more dubious um, or right-wing leaning um, um, sort of policies and attitudes within that ruling party so I'm just interested to know again how that um, can potentially threaten um, uh, so LGBTQ rights and, and, and attitudes when you have this effect of, of, a, of a sort of leadership or a government being framed in this one way where they become almost slightly untouchable for a, for a time from criticism and, and I'm, I'm not trying to um, sort of undervalue the importance at the moment obviously of, of this um, of what they're trying to do in terms of saving their country um, but I'm just again coming back to that idea of of the of the threat that this uh, that war can have, not just in this sort of physical sense, but in terms of, um, for a time, um, just threatening and, and ruining the um, the sort of different levels of dialogue that can happen in a country. Yeah, it's also complicated because in one I heard the story about the guy who was uh, serving as a soldier. He was gay, and the officer uh, make a public coming out for the other soldiers about him, that he's HIV positive and gay. And it was a really tough situation, but at the end, it turned out that because he's a soldier, they're serving together, so he's also uh, valuable for, for the society. So, uh, 
So it's it's really weird even to hear about it. But then, uh, as I said, the different groups, most of the community taking the position that they are protecting the country and they wanted to be part of that and they saying themselves that it, this is more important now. Uh, but I think it's what is the most interesting in that case that Ukraine is fighting for, 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 for themselves but also for Europe and for the values that are European values. So uh, part of this new Ukraine that also already started it's uh, the rights for all the mi minorities uh, that when there was this fake news and the kind of a uh, strong um, uh, that there were articles about the the racism on the borders and in Ukraine there were some cases but the way that it was written it was also a lot of time manipulated so it was interesting how the government of Ukraine immediately take the position about it and I Many times when I was before in Kyiv and in Ukraine, I saw that there is a lot of uh, like uh, Ukrainian people, and I believe that the government also now, they believe that this LGBT rights, women rights are part of the values that they wanted to share for years. And also the um, a big point in this game, because uh, Russia, as we know, have openly homophobic uh, law that it's the, like literally prosecuting LGBT communities you can show the rainbow it's really you can do the queer festivals and so on so this fight in Ukraine is also about this um, this uh, influence but uh, it's very typical uh, two days ago the main bishop of the I'm not sure about the English word but this uh, the the big of the Orthodox Church in uh, Russia, yeah, <clears throat> patriarch. Uh, probably, I know. I'm not sure if it's the correct word, but he's literally said that part of the problem with this war is that the West to start with these gay parades and so on. So he almost literally said that was quote that the aggression of uh, Russia and Ukraine was needed because of the gay prides. So when you see, hear something like that in the context of the people dying and the cities are bombed, you literally can imagine all this culture war and all this situation. So uh, I, I don't, uh, I'm not afraid that much for the pain because I think they're going in a good direction and it will be part of this fight and it will be even more um, advance after what is happening. That's, uh, I hope, what I... This um, this is also important, and usually when I talk about my practice to do queer archives, I'm quoting this uh, from the other church leaders, from Poland, from Romania, from Bulgaria, every time they were saying, if we join the European Union, we join the Eurosodom, so the gays will come. So this this is coming from the West, this thing, this, uh, and it's, it's, it's amazing to see that it's coming again and again, and this threat of, you know, this queerness coming from the West, that it's something that never existed before, that always giving me the kind of uh, drive to work on the archive and the stories to literally oppose the this narration sure yeah just um seeing as you're almost referring to your own practice and into sort of highlighting some of the the impetus and the sort of desire to do what you do it feels like um your position as a as a as an artist and a, and also an activist are really intertwined in terms of you wanting to uncover these histories and ensure that these histories and pasts can hopefully inform and reinforce the present that is such a seems to be such a strong sort of driving force for what you do how, how do you sort of balance um those two sort of attitudes and approaches in, in what you do or how do they inform each other yeah many times i was saying that i'm not real activist because i'm not active enough in the organization of being on the streets and so on. But then I realized that it's also a different tool that I could use as an activist. So for me, as you said, it's really um, this activism is kind of supporting, giving me the reason to do my artistic practice. And it's uh, uh, sometimes 
surprising how it really operates because I usually say also that I get back to the painting practice just because I wanted to be more in touch with the people and uh, not doing like a, you know, socialistic propaganda in the queer way, but rather using the tools that I really respond to the society. And by the society, I not only mean the queer community that could use the portraits, for example, but just the society. And I, it, it gave me a lot of thoughts, uh, what kind of tools are working, what can I use, and then how I could uh, be express myself also, also as an artist in, in that field. And uh, that, that's how I see it, but it's really um, mixed together. Also the aspect of education. I wouldn't be happy to say that I'm just a historian, activist and educator, but all these aspects are really present in my work. Also what we did in the Bonington Gallery with doing a, a series of posters from my paintings with the notes and the kind of educational way that they are literally spread out on the university and I want to continue that in that way. I think it's the best kind of example of how, of how I see I would like to work. Like I can sit in my studio reading books, focusing on some stories from the past, then I'm doing the best painting I can, playing with colors and form, but then when it's done, it's going to the world in a form of that could be very uh, easily accessible through the posters, social media, and really activated by the uh, societies and communities. And then this activism in, is meeting this art practice. And at, at least uh, now it's giving me a lot of kind of... Um, yeah, energy, like I really know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, sure. I think um, what I enjoy uh, with your work, and I think it's represented quite a lot in the exhibition, is the sort of tension between um, so-called sort of history and fact and uh, and kind of interpretation and sort of reappropriation of things. And you, you do that quite a lot. And I, um, in terms of sort of taking something that exists and reappropriating it and twisting it in some way and presenting it kind of as new. And for me, it sort of makes a commentary on the um, subjectivity of, of archives and the fact that and the difference between archives and history um, and the fact that often archives are very much formed from a singular perspective and don't necessarily, you know, and they often de depend on certain individuals gathering certain materials together. So I think, you know, I, I quite, enjoy that um, that mix or sometimes muddle between um, sort of activism and artists because I think there's this idea of sometimes sort of twisting up those narratives um, and almost just feeding those back into um, especially within an exhibition context where it's more ambiguous in terms of like what you're receiving as a viewer and encountering these things that you're you're questioning what is kind of facts and reality against something completely different um so i yeah i i kind of really enjoy that sort of mix of of things that come into your practice um yeah yeah sometimes it's coming uh, i'm always saying like history is literature so it really depends who have the power to write this particular part of the story and it's the same with the exhibition format when you see many of my shows that are in the queer archive institute project a very museum style look like some people think oh it's boring just the vitrines but in the same time but say by saying that oh it's just the museum it's just the boring or the vitrines they making the operation that they be, they make themselves believe that everything they see it's true fact so that's why it's boring because it's just the history and that's a trick because uh, when you do colorful very experimental arrangement then people could be uh, really impressed or ha can feel this queer magic but when you play with this museum format they uh, they have to questioning themselves or they will just get it uh, what they have as a part of the fact as a history so I, I really like to play with that and that's why I'm many times I'm saying whatever I'm doing recording uh, painting, I'm still a conceptual artist because it's a concept and then it's um, a lot of games with the people expectations and the way they even see the um, arrangement of the show like we did also in Bonington. Yeah, sure. I mean, even seeing how 
you've sort of utilized the the vitrines as objects and they don't necessarily become that you've used them differently i would say than maybe in a sort of museum or in perhaps like a a library or a sort of more of like a public information place where there's almost more like a there's more like an arrangement or a landscape of materials as opposed to just trying to fill the vitrines with material as a way there's a different way of sort of um almost it, it's kind of curate i mean i don't want to you know over word you have used the word curating it sort of appears everywhere but you have kind of curated this selection of materials where the display case the kind of the 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 the, the kind of the objective information equipment is kind of used more in a sort of painterly way of distributing almost like collaging these different aspects of of history and i think that idea of collaging um because like, there's like almost like myth and there's like um depictions of um certain people and then there's photo photographs and then there's like maps and bits of literature and again there's that thing of mixing up um these sort of tangible uh, facts and truth and fiction and and yeah I just, yeah I really I really enjoy that tension that comes into all of these things it's great and then just seeing how then and then looking at also the kind of exhibition history of of the Queer Archive Institute and how you've shown that in such a wide range of of different locations and places as well um, and your kind of commitment to then feature materials that connect to the locality as well as that exhibition again it sort of seems like those materials go out into the world different places and again their kind of interpretation or how they connect to that context changes every time um, yeah it's a part of the strategy also to engage people because i know that it's easy uh, it's, it's even different when there are different continents when I work in Brazil or Colombia but uh, or states. Uh, even in Europe I see this, oh, it's so interesting, it's from Eastern Europe, we don't know anything about it, so we believe you because we don't know anything. <laughs> you know, right? And then, oh, it's something from Nottingham, wow, let's look. And then you started to think, oh, who was first or which started when and how the AIDS was covered and suddenly it's becoming more complicated also, uh, yeah, so I think it's, uh, in one hand, I really wanted to work with, uh, with uh, local communities, but it's also part of this uh, question, uh, make the audience questioning what they see and being more engaged, because uh, then it looks almost, many times, many of these things look super similar, when especially the zines from the 80s, it's hard to even say, until you will not read which country they are representing. So, so, so yeah, and they also, as you said, they are arranged as a kind of a collages because um, um, it's over of the display that the museums pretend it's neutral. It's not only that museums are trying to make it more in the order, <laughs> but it's literally what it's more visual, what it's bigger, what it's, uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I usually also talk about it, but it's important, like, in the archives, especially the 70s, 80s, there is a, the majority of material is dedicated to uh, white homosexual men, and all the other uh, sexual representations are not really that much present. So, decision, if you would say, objectively, it's mostly about the gay men, so you're showing only gay magazines, and then something small. Uh, it's objective, but you are building this representation. So my uh, gestures of doing a bigger picture or a more uh, or hiding part of the material that it's overrepresented, it's also giving the idea how this archive could look like or how to start to think about it in a different way. And I, I, I of course, I'm uh, very subjective and. Uh, arranging these things, but it's literally saying that almost every museum exhibition, curators do the same uh, decisions. They just look more objective. And that's really funny that people believe, oh, we don't know if what you are doing is really true because it's so manipulative. But actually, by showing that, I feel like I'm more honest and really more get into the truth because yeah. literally how it works, the method itself. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, and I know when we were talking um, towards the beginning of the project, you were 
you were really wanted you were to stress the importance of of this exhibition not just sort of landing in Nottingham like a kind of spaceship and having no relation or connection or the idea that this exhibition was sort of stating uh, a stating fact around something and wasn't also involving more dialogues um and I guess also from our perspective of of um we worked really closely with the Sparrow's Nest um library um and archive in in Nottingham and like sending you the links to all of the digitized content and then you sort of looking at that from your perspective and your knowledge of what you have in your archive and then I know you were really drawn to the the diversion um magazines which are which was a, a Nottingham lesbian magazine um which also just uh visually is just a beautifully designed thing like it's it's a great um, so you were almost like looking, yeah, as you sort of say, you were sort of looking for gaps in the materials that you have and kind of wanting to sort of bring sort of bring that into things. Um, yeah, definitely. But yeah, we when we were looking at um, sort of magazines and publications from um, the sort of 80s and 90s, they were quite limited in representation. Um, you know, a lot of them, I think one um, periodical we were looking at was... Um, you know, started off as a sort of gay, then it was gay and lesbian, and then it was gay, then it was LGB. So you could sort of see the letters sort of, in, you know, expanding as long as soon as they get closer throughout the 90s and the 2000s. Um, and obviously we sort of stressed the importance that it wasn't uh, an overall representation of the queer community as a whole, but a sort of narrow aspect of it in some in some way. Um, but uh yeah, and I, and I think your um, interest as well in sort of extracting the um, the AIDS um, and sort of HIV, um, the sort of adverts and and turning those into posters, you know, was uh, and then putting those on, superimposing them on top of the AIDS wallpaper that you did as well. I I, I really, yeah, I really enjoy that uh, relationship between between that material. Um, yeah. Yeah, because it looks uh, so so similar, like the ads from Poland, and then you come in closer and see, oh, it's a knocking gun, and literally the phone uh, phone call number, like a phone number that uh, was there. So this history is uh, speaking loud, uh, just by the fact that it's uh, oversized. Uh, yeah, is the word like uh, yeah, oversized uh, ad, and uh, yeah, I, I that's why I'm always saying that. This is also the difference between me and academics or historians that as an artist I can use that tool, I could make a decision really quick. Oh, uh, there is a small note, but when we make it bigger and with the visual impact, it's completely working in a different way and giving you different thoughts. So that that's really works. Also references to the pop culture that are coming, but uh, in this uh, DIY materials, it's yeah, it's quite quite complex yeah yeah carol we've had um we've had a couple of questions um come through um which is great um yeah the first question is um what effect do you think the visibility of the queer community in war through social media will do for representation in poland and the surrounding nations I mean, I mean, I I believe it's more about the Ukraine now because of the war, right? Uh, so yeah, I think so. Yeah, so I think it's uh, yeah. I would what I was trying to express that probably there would be this uh, effect that people would think, oh, they were fighting with us, so they are like good people. I don't like it somehow that you need to succor life to prove are valuable, probably this will be only positive effects of that, right? Uh, they will not escape and this, also I don't like this, but the people who project the, the gays, they will not escape, they not only dancing, but they take these guns and fight with us. So, uh, but it's also uh, similar questions about the present, uh, the representation of women in the army and why they're they are going that they wanted to protect the country so it's changing the whole kind of image of the 
those groups and I think will it will help only for the good even if how it's constructed it's not my favorite kind of way of proving that you are worthy sure sure yeah yeah no sure thanks thanks Carol um, okay a question from um, Carl um, Gilbert um, I am Canadian and I was wondering how do you perceive the history of North American gay communities for example, you are interested in highlighting Poland's major queer figures as a political gesture of affirmation and social recognition, whereas here in America, we put forward our heroes in the 1970s. That said, does the Western community model influence your thinking and artistic practice? If so, how? You know, it's uh, everything is influenced everything. You could say like the contemporary uh, young generation in Poland is focusing only on RuPaul Drag Race show, and that's for them the most opening, the most queer and challenging kind of uh, culture reference. And they don't care about Judith Butler. They don't care about they don't care about Canada, Germany, England. They love Netflix. They love uh, RuPaul, and if there will be a film about it, like a post about the voguing culture. There is a strong voguing culture, that, which is really interesting. In Poland, uh, almost half of the voguing community, there is a Ukrainian refugees who are in Poland and they are taking over. So still almost exclusively white people, but uh, they are coming from the majority, minority groups. And it's really interesting to see how this on many levels, these Western influences are completely twisted in the local context. And that's how I feel about my practice. I don't feel like it's any Western influence in that, but uh, to give you an example, I said like first open gay show in the history of my country, but it was two years after I graduated. So when I was a student, my main reference was Andy Warhol. And uh, I thought, okay, I'm part of the queer nation, not Polish or East or West. So that would be the answer. Like you have to learn your local kind of tradition, history and methodology to, to change it. And I think what I'm doing now, it's, uh, it's different from typical West narration, like trying to find the different dates, different names and trying to rearrange the map. And uh, yeah. And, in the same time, playing with that, like my eight wallpaper, that it's this huge wallpaper in the gallery. It's uh, kind of uh, appropriating and mixing the general idea Canadian uh, group, but they appropriate uh, Robert Indiana and the style of Warhol and so on. So it's this conceptual dialogue rather with the West than just uh, influence. That's how I see it. Sure, sure. Um... Carl finishes off his question. Oh, well, there's this, uh, an extra note to say that Carl uh, loves your work, Carol, <laughs> as well, at the end of that um, question. Um, yeah, I just, um, yeah, I, I guess I just had a, a sort of another question, and I don't want to um, sort of have a romantic connotation of, of this, but in terms of your... Um, yeah, your position as being an artist and I know that you as an artist you also encapsulate other aspects of, of sort of practice and we've touched on sort of activism and, and other, other aspects of it but in terms of um, what what role right now um, can art or culture play in terms of what is happening in Ukraine and beyond is it is it something that is um, you know uh, yeah, what is what is that? I mean, it's it's played out in different aspects in terms of seeing sort of statues and important aspects of sort of physical culture being sort of protected in some way in, on the sort of streets of Ukraine and, and and different and different cities. I'm just wondering as well, as sort of um, as a sort of metaphor, if there's other things that need to be preserved or what the role of an artist or or yourself as well as being in this certain moment. I think there are two aspects. One is really basic, like big institutions uh, and smaller art institutions and residences should kind of help to organize donations, collect money, organize also the, um, to help to the Ukrainian artists to escape or survive or to help them to be in Ukraine and continue the work or survive as a 
to, to live, um, to, to survive, literally. So this is a, a lot of things to do because I don't want to prioritize any groups, but if we talk about the art context and art institution infrastructure, I think it's um, our duty to help, like what I'm trying to do to with the charity auctions, with the really collecting money and exchange of the uh, ideas, how to help particular communities and artists. And uh, second, maybe even more important, is to spread the word and to giving the voice for the Ukrainian artist. Um, Nikita Kadan, he's probably the most known Ukrainian artist. He, is, uh, he was planning to go for the residence in Vienna for, and just a day or two before he, his flight, he's stuck in Kyiv and he's still there. Vova Vorotnyov, um, Antoli Bielik, there is a lot of artists who are there, Lviv in um, Kyiv and other cities. And they, I see what I, that they are invited by some institutions to just speak up about what is happening, how they feel. And I think this is very important, this culture dialogue, to not thinking what we could do for them, but what they really need and want. And so by that, they also should have a space to express not only the thoughts and the history of the war, but rather the culture itself. Because if the Ukrainian culture would be really present in the exhibitions and the uh, discourse, nobody will be writing articles questioning the independence of this country, like this, uh, you know, patronizing that, oh, almost like a Russian, so maybe they should be just neutral and so on. So I think it's a huge uh, impact of culture by uh, creating the idea that it's a, a independent culture itself. Yeah, sure, sure. Half of my job now, it's like on Instagram, I'm trying to what is happening there, but also to spotlighting kind of the aspects of uh, the um, artists and the, the culture from the, the, the Ukraine. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, another question, uh, this has come in, um, Carol. What um, is next for the archive? Um, are you planning more shows? Um, do you think you'll take a step to collect um, materials with the situation in Ukraine in mind? Do you think that might frame a certain strategy or priority with the with the Queer Archive Institute? The idea of Queer Archive Institute, that's why it's plural archives. Because Queer Archives, so apologies, yeah. To connect people, to build a big network and to not appropriate other countries' archives or activist work, but rather to collaborate. And I'm an artist, I'm organizing the shows that I'm showing preview and collaborate with some people. But uh, when we talk about Ukraine and the war, I think my role will be to help the local communities to build their own kind of archive and to tell the stories. And maybe it will reflect in my presentations, definitely it will reflect, but I rather, if I'm going to, uh, you know, to Czech, to Slovakia, to Romania, anywhere, I'm trying to work with the locals so they could uh, establish their own narration. This is always important. So even if I'm from Poland and it's close to this country, it doesn't mean that I will be the more, uh, like older brother, more progressive. So I will take over the material and I will tell them the story. No, the whole thing is to how to make the bridge or how to give them know-how and to share it. Not, not necessarily every country have the artist that is uh, artist and queer and interested in archives. That's a different story. Sometimes the activists really focusing, like in Belarus, for example, really focusing on contemporary political situation, struggle and, uh, and so on. So th there is no time for the archival work. Then I could help with parts. But um, yeah, my idea is to continue that work. And maybe if I will have more money and time, I will try to do something like a foundation. So the, the material that I already collect will be protected and could be run by some body or some people in the future. Sure. If I will die. So it's like a, a project, definitely. It's not just for one show or another. And yeah, it's an open structure. Yeah. If, with, the, with the Queer Archives Institute, that you've mentioned before, and, and it sort of indicated that it, it is just you. You know, there isn't this sort of grand... Uh, big institution in a way that actually um, there's it, there's almost a slight a slight um, not a joke but it's like a slightly tongue in cheek is what we would say that there's this idea of calling it an institute in a in a, in a way of sort of critiquing 
the idea of an institute. Um, but really, it's almost just another form of it's almost a, a kind of cons almost like a conceptual work in itself. <laughs> um, the QAI. Yeah, it's from the very beginning because I said that it was started uh, November 15, 2015, only because I paid for the website domain that date <laughs> to design the logo. And then uh, I opened the account on Instagram and Facebook and it started and people constantly writing and, you know, it's literally because you have some photographs from the exhibitions and the logo and the profiles, people think that you're a big institution. And uh, it's definitely part of the game because I always saying that I'm not willing to do the proper gay and lesbian museum in Warsaw. It's rather, that's why I choose the name Institute because I play with the knowledge, but also having this pop-up uh, exhibitions and uh, sometimes it's only a form of performance. Also the issue of the magazine could be part of the Quora Cup. But on the other hand, I see the problem that it's only me, not only because I have to work so hard and it's on me, but it's also, I believe that it should be more group process and involving more people also to share different perspectives. But it's, uh, for, for what I see now, it's the hardest thing to achieve because uh, in one hand, many times I'm for, uh, going somewhere to these countries we mentioned because I have the money from the other project or I'm invited by the exhibition and then I'm doing my research. It's hard to take five people with me. And then uh, also I'm busy with working on that materials and it's hard to involve other people. Most of the time I don't have really money to pay somebody for regular job and also to base only on volunteers who are coming and going to introduce them the whole system and all this archival material. It's really hard. So I struggle on the time level, technical level, but I feel the need to open more for the group process with mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, sure. Carol, we've um, we've been talking to for an hour now, and um, so I think we're gonna we're gonna draw things um, to a to a close. Um, but I just want to say uh, a massive thanks for for joining us um, tonight. And it it's it's so evident that so much has changed um, within your sort of locality, but globally uh, during this exhibition and. Uh, yeah, um, and it's quite astonishing just how much is what, what is going on. Um, so yeah, um, just want to yeah say thanks again because I know you're sort of nursing some post dentist uh, pain uh, as well. Um, so yeah, thanks for pushing through pushing through that um, and for making such a um, a wonderful exhibition too and and doing so in yeah in really difficult circumstances uh, with COVID um, and your own uh, sort of restrictions and things too. So. Um, yeah, to any any of you who um, who can do do come along um, to the exhibition um, before we close at three pm um, on Saturday, if you can, and um, yeah, and uh, thanks to you all for for tuning in um, this evening um, and for your your questions. So um, yeah, thanks thanks very much, and take care, everybody. Thank you very much. Take care, Carl. <laughs> Thank you, Chad.